Good morning, Southside. We have a bunch of families who went to support um, our sweet church plant this morning, and they will be back worshiping with us next week, but um, just excited, as Greg shared, for this great blessing of what's going on. Um, Welcome to any first-time guests. I love having guests. It's just so good to have you join the family of God and come and, and worship with us. We are currently studying through the book of Romans. This morning, we are going to start a new chapter uh, in our study, and it's the last chapter in Romans. We're going to take up chapter 16 and kind of finish up Paul's closing thoughts. Uh, Sometimes Paul gives a salutation, just, you know, or just a normal salutation. You just kind of sign your name. But this one is profound with some great truth to be mined from his last words to Rome. So my goal this morning is to take up all of Paul's greeting to the saints in in one message, verses 1 through 16. I don't think the detailed specifics are where the lesson is as we close out, but rather looking at the heart of Paul for these saints, why the greeting, and not maybe try to figure out all the specifics of everyone who he is greeting. Many of them are names that we're not familiar with. And so maybe what made them so dear to the apostles' heart is what I want to know. And then maybe what what would it take for our names to be included in Paul's letter here at Southside? This message is just going to tie together all that we've learned over the years in this letter. And it will bring us uh, to some powerful questions of our own lives. And so may God be honored and glorified in our midst this morning. Uh, Maybe this last angle from Paul will pierce your heart and lead you to the gospel love and warmth as we join hearts to advance the kingdom of God together. So let me read it, and we'll pray. Verse 1, and bear with me, I've listened to all these names and have looked at them, and I'm going to still butcher them. So um, it's, it's not your name, so you should be okay. Um, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is in Centuria, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you. For she herself has also been a helper of many and myself as well. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risked their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Also greet the church that is in their house. Greet Epinatus, my, uh, my beloved, who's, in, who's the first convert to Christ from Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are outstanding among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Greet Ampelatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Orbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachus, my beloved. Greet Apelles, the approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my kinsman. Greet those of the household of Narcissus, who are of the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, workers in the Lord. Greet Persis, the beloved, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, a choice man of the Lord, and also his mother and mine. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermes, and the brethren with them. Greet Philo- Philologus and Julia, Nerus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss for all the churches of Christ. Greet you. Let's go to our God and pray. Father, we thank you for what we look at this morning. I pray that we would get the apostles' heart, and by the gospel that we have studied and looked at from every angle, that it would be our hearts. God, that the the love of Jesus Christ has melted our hearts into love for you and love for each other. God, I pray that you would unite us and bond us together in this blessed bond. I pray now that you will use this time together to bring much glory to you, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So as I begin, I just wanted to mention to uh, Ken uh, shared with me before I walked up here, their community group starts up this week, and they're going to be doing something, you know, neat in the gospel, uh, or the epistles of 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. It's going to be really 
how do you study and mine the truth for yourselves? And I know they're doing something similar with Jude of, of learning how to ask the right questions of the text and go find the truth together. So I encourage you uh, to, to look into that this week. So my introduction, I've been trying to work testimonies in more and more, and it's just, it's been rougher and rougher. So I've come up with a, a new idea for this sermon. Uh, if, if it fails, it was my idea, so you can kick me around. Uh, but what I is I wanted to bring a testimony that I think captures everything that I want to say uh, in these verses. So I've asked her, uh, she, she hates public speaking, so she recorded it. And we're going to listen to this testimony. And she said, how long does she have? And I said, about 38 minutes is how long my introductions normally go. So you're, you're safe. So uh, let's, if you guys could, let's play that introduction and then I'll preach from there. Hi, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Andrea Ryan. Um, I'm married with a daughter, and we've been at Southside for over seven years. Uh, I didn't get saved until five years ago. Um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, didn't meet any Christians until my 20s, and I was just entangled uh, with sins of sexual immorality, uh, intoxication of all kinds. Uh, my life was just out of control, but the Lord mercifully um, saved me. He just decided that he would have me, and so he had me. Um, so I returned to Southside, where I was welcomed with deep love and humility by the saints. Although I was attending church as a believer, I felt as though I didn't have a place and didn't fit into any particular group or crowd. The younger generation, or my generation, seemingly had it all together. None of them had been to jail or struggled in ways that I had, and I stayed away from them out of pride and fear of man. I eventually started to meet with saints that were older than me, uh, women who had lived in the world and who were now walking in freedom in Christ, um, just vulnerable and willing to share. I decided that I was only going to latch on to them. They seemed wiser, uh, more loving, and they had walked longer um, in the Lord, and I just had felt comfortable with this. <clears throat> My plan to isolate and be selected, uh, selective with the body would have worked, <laughs> but the Lord sovereignly gave me a daughter who is not going to stay on the outskirts or stick to herself. She was a wild, crazy toddler, and the young people just grabbed a hold of her. They loved her deeply, and she was just eager to uh, see them, spend time with them, get to know them. The Lord knows me very well, uh, so that's why he gave me her as a daughter. She was just bringing people up to me, um, like she had known them from decades, meet my mom, meet so-and-so, um, and so she was just a really sweet blessing at the beginning of my walk. Um, I started to meet, to meet and engage with them, um, but I was still hesitant to get close. About a year had passed, and these two women who were new to the church, um, they were newly saved, they were attending like five Bible studies a week. The Lord was already expressing to me um, in his word, the need for unity with the entirety of the body. But in fear, I continued to hide and stay uh, where I was comfortable. I had become friends with these women, and they were so different than me um, and each other. And I watched them cling to the body. Um, and I watched them grow with people who were 30 years um, older than them, or with people who were 15 to 20 years younger than them. Um, and I felt that I had missed out on so much. Um, and yeah, like that I was just foolish to stay away. Um, so my family recently went through a very serious and long trial. And in this, he graciously rooted me uh, into the body of Christ. I saw the need for every interaction from every person I met. And I slowly just couldn't help but dive in. Uh, the people at the studies were eager to walk with me through the difficult season. Uh, eager to ask me how I was doing. Eager to pray. Eager to listen and encourage me. They were just eager to love me. I feared getting too close to people, but then they started weeping with me in prayer each week. Um, they started calling me. They started helping me financially. They brought me food when I was sick. They cared for my daughter. Um, they just cared for me in so many ways. And everyone fit, and they were all so different. And I loved hearing how the Lord was working perfectly and personally in each life, each unique personality ripping away each hidden idol and restoring uh, each personal and just unique uh, pain of the heart. 
I intentionally started asking them their stories, and I found that not one testimony was the same. They, of course, had similarities. Some were saved from the world like I was. Um, some were saved from their self-righteous good lives. Some had been in trials like mine. Some were in um, just healthy relationships. They were saved at seven. Um, I just got to know the Lord more intimately by hearing everyone's different praises to Him. Uh, whether they lived the way that I did or not, they needed to be saved. And by mercy alone, they were saved. Um, they each were part here uh, for my growth and for my benefit. I've been able to ask the homeschooled people the pros of cons and homeschool, uh, where they struggle, how like I could take the gospel to my daughter, uh, just in different ways. I got to ask people who had healthy relationships how they got this way, where they had journeyed. Um, I lived with a woman saved before high school who I got to see humbly and sweetly submit in her role and care biblically for her family. The Lord put me there in that home, and I'm just so thankful that they are who they are and that they're not um, any other way. Different is good for me. I don't need more me's. Um, the church does not need more Andreas, um, and I'm sure that we're all just thankful for that. Uh, the sweetest counsel and friendship I have gotten has been from people that I wouldn't have sought it from in my flesh. Some of our theology hasn't lined up. Some of them had um, really solid relationships. Some of them single, some of them married, some of them loud, some of them quiet. Um, and yet they have all loved me in the same spirit. When I was in the heat of my trial, it was easy for me to find friends who agreed with me um, on my side, who gave me counsel that matched what I wanted to hear. Um, and there was this one lady, she is the sweetest lady, who so tenderly, uh, she just didn't agree or give me um, counsel that I had heard before. And I was just so refreshed by hearing what she had to say. She hadn't journeyed what I had been journeying. Um, but she was hopeful and compassionate and merciful when I was not. If the Lord hadn't have placed that woman in my life, my family may not be here. And this is his sweet, uh, tender mercy and love towards me to give me someone who uh, disagreed and lovingly reminded me of things that I had forgotten. Um, yeah, he was just so good to me uh, in that moment and in just all of the moment. Um, I don't deserve the body, but what a gift it is that I have grown to know my need for it. The Lord is my father, and it's like he's given the church to me as a mother to nurture me, to care for me, to encourage me, and lovingly correct me for my good and for his glory. Uh, looking back, I don't know how I tried to do it as I did. Um, in all honesty, like... You guys are just my family, my my best friends, um, and I'm just thankful that I get to witness how you walk and love one another. Um, I'm not even sure why you guys have loved me the way that you have most of the time, but I've learned that your love for me isn't based on how much I know, on how wise I sound, on what sins I do and don't struggle with. It's just deeper with that. It's the love of Christ and I'm glad that he's broke me enough to enjoy it how, he, how he's planned it, how he's perfectly planned it to be. Um, my husband now, like, he prays every night and um, he just leads us in prayer and he's so thankful for the body, thankful to God for what the body means to us, how they've journeyed with us, um, just how they've helped us. Um, my love for you guys, I can't express... Um, yeah, without just getting tearful, I was writing this and just crying, like just thinking about what the Lord has done through you guys personally for just me and my daughter and my husband and just everything. Um, I just really mean that. I cherish you all as different and unique as you all are. Um, on a side note, I wanted to close with a really funny story. Every time I think about it, I laugh. Um, <clears throat> so before I was saved, I thought I was a Christian, but I wasn't. I was trapped in Mosaic law and food regulations, feast days, you name it. Uh, I thought that basically everyone at Southside was cool. Uh, so Ken had asked me to meet up um, so I could hear the gospel. So he took me um, out to breakfast. Chili. Uh, and I was just looking at him. Uh, I was kind of in shock. Like... Um, 
yeah, thinking like this guy is eating pork. Uh, like, has he ever read the Bible? Like, he's going to share the gospel. Um, and I didn't mention it. Normally, my mouth would have just been open. And but for whatever reason, um, I just decided that I would watch him and listen to what he had to say. Um, and right after I left, I knew that he was saved. Heart for the Lord, and he was resting in Christ. Not, um, he was rejoicing and had joy. In he just had no joy. Um, and so he just gave me the gospel, and I knew he believed it, even if we didn't eat the same things or even agree on it. And all that happened that day was the Lord's goodness. My conscience, my theology. If I would have known pork was on the menu, I would not have gone. But the Lord wanted me there that day. And I just today, now looking back on my pride and how all of it played out, if Ken known I struggled, he would not have ordered it. But he didn't know. I'm glad that I can laugh about it today and just look on... Um, that moment, and he's thankful um, that he knew better than I did, and that he's just body in ways that I haven't gotten to experience. Um, so I just wanted to say I love you guys. I'm excited to see um, just grows us all in this. Dive in more and get to just see him work in all of your lives. That's what happens when the gospel gets into your heart. To God be the glory. I always think of a breakfast burrito with green chili. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm, I'm shaking a little bit because um, I don't get to do an intro. This really is a beautiful message then in this passage. Every name in this list is inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. In Philippians, he says, greet all those who are in Christ Jesus. And here Paul gives a length of names, and I want to just jump in and go through them. And this is what Greg, uh, teaching through Colossians this morning, went through the same thing. So everyone in his Sunday school, I'm sorry. You know, it was so beautiful and well done that you've you got to go through this a list at the close again. But for those who didn't hear it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get you Blessed. There's something beautiful to look at with me. So let's begin. I'm foundation uh, to Phoebe. Uh, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who's a servant of the church in Centuria. So it's a pagan name. It's the, the feminine form of Phoebos, which was the god Apollo. And she was saved, and now she's a servant. And what we learn in this passage, she helped many people. In Centria, it's the eastern part of the city of Corinth. And most scholars are in agreement that she was most likely the bearer of this letter to the church in Rome. She's the one who's carrying this, what Paul has written to that church. So there's no mail system, and, and Phoebe's going to be the one to deliver it. The rest of the people, Paul says, hey, uh, uh, I greet him, greet him, greet him. And here he says, I commend her to you. Uh, ask them to assist and to help her as well. So Paul is in Corinth. He chose a responsible person to deliver the letter. And she's a servant. And it's this word for, for deacon even. It's, a, it's a, a helper. So I don't know if it's so much the, the position or title, but, but more just that idea of the servant in this word. She, she's a servant. She's helped many. Yeah, Paul says she's even helped me. She's an excellent wor uh, woman of God, a great servant to the church. Donald Barnhouse said, never was there a greater burden carried by such tender hands. The theological history of the church through the centuries was in this manuscript, which she brought with her. The Reformation was in that baggage. The blessing of multitudes in our day was carried in those parchments. It's beautiful that Paul entrusted such a delivery to this faithful woman. And we will see Paul's high view of women even in this list, some that could go either way as male or female uh, by, by the Greek language, not what we know today in our land. Uh, nine of them are women. And he kind of gets sometimes a, a bad rap, I think, Paul is a chauvinist 
because of God's orders and that he, he has elders that are to be men and they're to lead and teach in the doctrine. But what I want you to get, what a beautiful role women have played in the history of the church and its advance and its service uh, to rejoice and see its beauty. I don't want you to feel oppressed because you can't do my role but flourish in the beautiful way that God has designed you for the blessing of the church and the spread of the gospel. So praise the Lord for Phoebe, a great servant of the church of God as she delivers Romans the letter. Second, I want to look at the salutations, which are in verses 3 through 15. And I'm just trying to get an outline here. We're going to break it down into nine groups of people. And I want to start in verse 3 with what I'm going to call some fearless friends. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risk their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So greet Prisca and Aquila, uh, it, it, and I'm not sure why he shortened it here, but it's the same couple. One of the few names that we've really heard in this list, it's mentioned in six different places in the New Testament. Aquila was a Jew from Pontus. He was forced to leave Rome when the emperor Claudius expelled the Jews. And so he and his wife moved on. He found a certain Jew, Acts 18.2, named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. So Paul met with him in Corinth and they both were tent makers. And when Paul left Corinth for Ephesus, He went with them and they stayed on in Ephesus, which we see in Acts 18. And at the time of the writing of Romans, he's returned now to Rome. And it appears to be well known to the churches of Rome, this godly couple. And in verse 4, they they form my life, they they risk their own necks. Maybe there were those riots were recorded during Ephesus. We don't really know for sure, but, but they, they risked their lives for Paul at, the, at a great cost of their own lives. So they, they, they had a group of believers where we see here meeting in their house. They, they did home churches, it looks like, in every city. So this was a, a faithful couple that Paul says, fellow workers. You're my fellow gospelers, my, my fellow laborers for this gospel that we've been studying for four years. You're, you're laboring with me because I'm not ashamed of it. It's the power of God for salvation. It appears that they were very faithful friends of Paul, even to the end. In 2 Timothy, at the end of Paul's life, he lists 21 names, and he says, greet Priscilla and Aquila. And so these were intimate friends of Paul, and they labored together all their days, it appears, to make Christ known. And then in verse 5, we see the first fruit. Greet the church that's in their house. Greet Epinatus, my beloved, who's the first convert to Christ from Asia. And I love, here's where we're going to hear this name several times, uh, my beloved. It it draws out his affection more than others. There's something about this name that it drew out my, my, my beloved who's the first convert to Christ in my labors in Asia. The first fruit, you would come and present it to God, and it was a pledge of more to come. And so this, this uh, Epinatus, this man represented the pledge of the harvest of the gospel that would spread in that region. And so this man was special to Paul's heart. And then in verse 6, I'm going to call these the fatiguing laborers that uh, Colossians 1 is built upon, that we labor to the point of fatigue for this gospel. Greet Mary who has worked hard for you. Look at verse 12. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, who are workers in the Lord. This, this workers to fatigue. Greet Persis, the beloved, who has worked hard in the Lord. And so Mary and Miriam, they, they, they're these laborers who have, have given their lives to exhaustion. It, it's a great word that Paul chose. It did. It, it meant to labor, to absolute fatigue, to, to weariness. And so these are people who are li- given their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The, the, this woman was not tired of working. She was tired from working. She worked for Christ in verse 6, and the saints, not a clock, 
She was not looking for ease. She was looking at needs and she's moving to them and she's laboring and she's working. She's working to fatigue. She put her hands to the plow. The same word in verse 12, Tryphena and Tryphosa, workers in the Lord and Persis. These four women who the Holy Spirit brought to Paul's mind, have the saints esteem them and honor and greet them for their wearisome labor of love in the God. These are the ones who put their whole being into the ministry of the church. It was interesting that as I'm studying this, this this word that's used for these laborers, it's it's not mentioned to one man that's listed in here. It was was the ladies who are laying out their lives to fatigue that Paul's remembering, saying, give them honor. In those days, the the women would take care of the sick and the poor, visit those in prison. They were charged with care and nurture of new women converts in Titus 2 to assist them in their day-to-day needs. They were just essential to the church of God. Because they are not to be elders and set the doctrine and be the guardians of the truth, it did not make them lesser. They they rolled up their sleeves, they labored for the saints of God and poured it into each other. Paul appreciates these women and their labor. My joy is with those who are laboring to the point of fatigue in this body. Some, your health suffers from it. Counseling and prayer, discipleship, cleaning homes, hospitality, fighting for the unborn, just laboring for the name above every name. To God be the glory for you, saints. Verse 7, my fellow prisoners, greet Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are outstanding among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. And so these are my kinsmen, um, Jews from Tarsus. And they're they're my fellow prisoners. Most commentators went that they probably were imprisoned with Paul, more being in it with him. And they're outstanding among the the apostles as messengers of the gospel. And they were also in Christ before him. Some think it might go back to Pentecost when they were converted. And then the slaves in verses 8 through 9. Great Ampelatus, my beloved in the Lord, Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, Statius, my beloved, and greet Apelles, the proved in Christ, and greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. My beloved in the Lord. Again, Ampliatus was a common slave name. And, and what I learned in my studies this week is that the free men usually had more than one name. And so it was most often a one name when you see it in this list, uh, usually was a slave. And so Paul loved this man in the Lord. Again, the the same family. And it's interesting, but not dogmatic. The cemetery of Domitilla was the earliest of the Christian catacombs. And there's this elaborate tomb with one single word, Ampliatus. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ. That word means refined or city bred. And status, my beloved, means hay or seed. And so I want you to keep, the, I'm moving quick because I want you to get the picture of this church. And now we're seeing the slaves who are in it. In verse 10, we're going to see the tested ones. Greet Apelles, the approved in Christ. The approved in Christ, dokimazo, that that word for sticking metal in the furnace and what's boiled off is this approved, purified gold. And Paul's saying, man, greet this Apelles. He's been through some kind of intense trial that must be known publicly. And what's come out is this approved faith that loves and trusts God more. This man went through some kind of testing or temptation and came out approved the purifying of something through testing, it's genuineness. They, they would stamp it with genuine. And this, this one is genuine and it's public. He was tested. He's the real McCoy. Greet that one. 
How many are seated here this morning with that stamp? I have watched some of you suffer and the things that you've gone through, and there's this approved faith, and God, I just greet them. Don't you, don't you love the saints who have suffered, and they, they're just deep, and they love Jesus, and there's just something to them. Thank you, Jesus, for them in this body. And Paul's just thinking of them. Greet them. They're special ones. Give honor to them. And what I love about Paul, whose medal was tested more than Paul? Approved. And he's giving preference and honor to Apelles. He's living out what he wrote. Give honor to this man who's been tested. And then he moves to the imperial court in verse 10. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my kinsmen, and greet those of the household of Narcissus uh, who are in the Lord. And in Rome, there was a grandson of the Jewish king, Herod the Great, uh, Aristobulus. His name was that. And when Herod died, all of his slaves would be passed on to him. And so this could be the Jewish slaves, now Christians, members of the Roman church. Greet them. Greet Herodian, my kinsmen. Greet those who are the household of narcissists. Some of you grew up in that household. <laughs> um, Greet those of the household of a narcissist who are in the Lord. It was the name of a wealthy freedman who had been prominent under Claudius, but had been put to death by Nero. So it's possible that that God had placed them as believers in the house of Nero. So here's the gospel again going out in this imperial court. Greet them. In verse 13, the favored family. (coughs) Greet Rufus, a choice man in the Lord, And also his mother and mine. Greet Rufus, a choice man, to be chosen of God, selected. And and, and, and looking this week, interesting, in Mark 15, 21, they pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, who's going to carry the cross. And it says, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. (laughs) Simon was this guy's father. And his father carried the cross of Christ. He saw the Lamb of God that was slain. And so he says, greet him and his mother, who is figuratively my mother. And then greet the fellowshippers in verse 14. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermes, and the brethren with them. Greet Philogus and Julia, and Nurses and his sister, and Olympus and all the saints who are with them. More than likely, these two groups were meeting in home churches. And so Paul is sending his greetings. And what's amazing is that he knew where the groups were meeting, he knew where, he knew their names. He said, You were on my heart. He's praying for them. He wants to come see them. This is a man who took great interest in the church of God and his people. And as I look at all these names, it's just, there's not many wise, mighty, noble. God just builds his church from all different ways and all different places and all different people. And what I loved about Andrea's testimony is she has learned the beauty of the body of Christ and all its difference and all its varieties and, and the world. It's, I got to find someone who is exactly my age that believes the same things and likes the same sports. And until I find that, I'll never have koinonia. And what I want you to see what she found is I have koinonia with anyone who believes in Jesus Christ. That's what's going on here in Rome. Please let that set you free this morning in the gospel. And then verse 16 greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Peter called it the kiss of love. It was a form of greeting, an expression of your love for one another. It was nothing uh, romantic or anything of the sort. Simon in Luke 7, Jesus said to him in condemning that Pharisee, when I came in, you you gave me no kiss of greeting. And then Judas perverted the greeting with a kiss as he betrayed him. That's not what a kiss was meant for. The kiss was a sign of affection with the early church. And so some of you can breathe easy because this is not a call for us today at Southside. 
I've noticed my friend Rich Klepper hugging the brethren now, but I, don't, I think the holy kiss might make him leave. <laughs> so, I want you to just hear one thing, though. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, we should not be ashamed to show outward affection to one another. We're the same family in Jesus Christ. We're going to spend eternity together. We're fighting the same fight of faith. We're aliens and sojourners. I remember whenever Ray would, would come in, you know, I, I hate not having him here this morning, but he just would always give me a kiss on the cheek. His father-in-law would give me two. Um, when you grow up Irish Catholic, that doesn't happen in your family. And then my little Italian friend, Adamo Lentini, that, that guy gave me a wet one every time I saw him on the cheek. I always had to do this every, every time. But I don't know what it was. It, it just made me feel so loved, you know, like this, this greeting. And in a healthy family, um, it's affectionate. So be expressive of your love for one another. When I counsel children who never got affection from their dads or their moms. It's sad. It's one of my hobby horses, but sometimes it takes a funeral before we share what people really mean to us. Just often share what, each, what you mean to each other. Be loving and affectionate toward one another and be appropriate. This should be so natural because we love the Christ that we see being formed in each other. We're the family of God. Every Sunday, we act like we haven't seen each other for a year. If you're a visitor, I hope you saw that. Going, something weird is going on in this place. What a testimony that it is to the world and many in the church today when we dwell together in unity. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And all the churches of Christ greet you. Who could say that but Paul? There's no isolation. There's no tribalism. There's no territory. There was just a true love and concern for churches. We're all on the same team that hold to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're one. There was a true love and concern among the churches. And they're rejoicing in the gospel going to the nations. We just all helped one another to whatever we can do to get that gospel message out. We're, we're there. I've been working with a bunch of churches even right now to see how can we all work together and planting churches here and afar. I love that saying. Their, their theme is we can do more together than, than single. The mindset is crucial that we're all on the same team pulling for the name that is above every name. And we love each other. Let's close. I'm give you some application. Andrea, you want to make the application? Okay. Was it weird having to sit there and hear yourself? During COVID, I, I had to record a sermon before, and then I'm sitting in my living room with my wife and watching yourself preach. It was horrible. So... <laughs> compassion. <laughs> I just want to start, really what jumped out at me was the number of names, 27, that Paul knows and expresses his love and his greeting to them. And I, I don't know how many he's met in the journey in different places and how much he just knows by being so plugged in and, and involved. And so maybe, do you even know 27 names at Southside? That's a big application to Romans. Paul said this in Acts 20. Be on the alert. Remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. 1 Thessalonians 2.8, I have thus a fond affection for you, you were well pleased, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you became so very dear to us. In 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, 28, apart from such external things, all his beatings and all that he went through, there's the daily pressure upon me of concern for all the churches. 
I just care about you. It, it sits on me. The enemy is coming at you. The battles, the, the Pharisees sowing strife and legalism. And I just care. And I just want you to see the gospel of Jesus Christ opens up that heart to love and care. If it's still Grinch, you're just not getting the power of the gospel that Paul wanted to take and preach. And I don't care how great your theology is, if it doesn't open up your heart to love, you're not getting what this is. Second, the relationships and partnerships are amazing to me as I'm watching them. What the gospel does to the children of God, the names that Paul uses in this list, they just grab me. Brothers, sisters, servants, helpers, fellow workers, beloved, kinsmen, chosen man, a mother to me. Don't let those words get by you. Is this how you look at the body of Christ? Is this how you look at it? Or do you look at it with a critical eye and a distancing eye? A judging eye? The gospel of Jesus Christ demands an answer. The foundation of this affection is the cross of Christ and our union with Him. I was sitting in Sunday school and I, I didn't mean to get distracted. But Greg's teaching, I, I noticed what's here and I noticed what's there. And it's so that you will never lose sight of the cross of Jesus Christ. That's what binds us together like this. This cross, the love of God, produces love for his children, his brothers and sisters. And that's where the, my third is the, all these greetings, they carry so much love. Uh, look at verse 5 again. Greet the church that is in their house. Uh, uh, greet Epinatus, my beloved. Verse 8. Greet Ampelatus, my beloved. Verse 9. Orbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Statius, my beloved. Greet Tryphena and Trophosa, workers in the Lord. Greet Persis, the beloved. So this greeting isn't um, how you doing. It's carry my love to them. Here's my love. I remember when, when I went to St. Lucia, I've shared before, but after a week of ministering there, when we left, we were, we were sobbing on each other. When, when I, I planted a church called the Master's Bible Church, and after seven years, Laura and I came out to plant Southside Bible Church, and for three hours, we just sat weeping with the saints, just weeping on each other. There's so much love. Has the gospel opened this up in you? Be honest before God. Here's the application. Has it opened it up? And I don't mean do you have a sentimental, mushy love. I get 10 engineer hugs every Sunday and they're great. It can't be faked. It can't be hypocritical love as we saw at the beginning in Romans 12. This is what flows out when you realize that you're chosen by God like Rufus. I was watching a movie with my wife a while back, and I, I, I meant to ask the details because I forget all of them. But I knew it, I remember enough. It, there was a soccer team. And the soccer team, it's a true story, uh, they were in a mine that flooded. And, and they're in this, trying to figure out how to get in there to rescue them. And I, I think they were in there, how many days do you think it was? 10, 12, 14. It, it was a long time. So everyone, the news, everyone's gathered. People are risking their lives, the rescuers, trying to get them out. And, and finally at the end, they, they got them all out and everybody was hugging. <laughs> You've, they've never met most of these people before. And, you know, hugging, weeping, sobbing, because they, they came together for a mission to get this little soccer team out from the peril and danger of death. And all I can think is we gather every Sunday and we've all been saved from the wrath of God. I just want to hug you and celebrate. You are no longer under the wrath of God. Come hug me. <laughs> Doesn't that do something for you? 
You've been, you've been brought out. You've been rescued. This is the time. I, I love that the Lord's Day was moved from the Sabbath to Sunday because you walk in here every Sunday ready to celebrate that He's risen. I don't walk in like it's still Good Friday. We, we have an elder who, who won't let me turn the lights off on Good Friday because he knows Sunday came. And I want you to get that. This, this is just, we've been delivered from the wrath of God. Come hug me. I mean, they were hugging over a soccer team that got delivered from a, a drowning. The wrath of God for eternity is off you. Oh. Come celebrate with me, brothers and sisters. That shouldn't close your heart up and say, I've never met you. <laughs> Come here. I love you. For brothers and sisters in the gospel of Jesus Christ to advance it. Oh, do our differences get bigger than our rescue? Write that down. Do our differences get better than our rescue? Than our salvation? I was just meditating and asking myself, how, how do we grow in this? How do we love like this? And I came across some application from another preacher that I'm going to borrow. It says, it happens in verse 13 where Rufus, God chose him. You may not be the choice of the world, but you're God's choice. And you just can't get over that. And Paul keeps saying how long they were in Christ. They were, they were in Christ. They were in Christ. So when, when you look at the, the brothers and sisters, you're, you're in Christ. You are in Christ. And then he kept talking about in verses 9 and 12, our partnership in ministry. We're, we're all in this together, laboring to advance the name of Jesus Christ with all these different gifts. Like, there is such a bond. This 25 years thing is hitting me hard. Thanks for mentioning it, Greg. <laughs> it's a blink. And we've been laboring together in ministry for so long. I think of all that my wife has done. All that she's done in giving up her health and her life for this body. And so many of you, these long runs and fighting the faith together and the perseverance that you've never quit. I've watched you go through cancers and divorces and hardships. the deacon board. Jason Sweezy and I were together in, when I taught a college group before we even began this. I was looking, thinking about the elders. If you add Robin and Ray, added it up over 170 years of service together. <laughs> the love is unbelievable when you enter into the battle together. And it, it brings love. And then in verse 7, shared sufferings. That we share in each other's sufferings. Hard times forge the deepest friendships and bonds that you can ever have. I think of my brother Mike and Brian Rutland and seeing what God's done in my brother's life and saving it. And my brother who gave up his kidney for my brother Mike. And every time I see that brother, I, I can't get out of my head this love through Christ that my brother's alive because of his sacrifice. That does something. So let's carry each other's sufferings and suffer together for the name of Jesus Christ. And the Apostle John says, this is how you know that you passed out of life into death if you love the brethren. Has Romans done this to you? Let's pray. Father, I pray that this fruit has happened in our hearts because of the beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ. It's brought us out from the dominion of self and self-love and self-seeking. God, it's given us a love for one another because we love Jesus Christ. We love his gospel and we are joined together to labor, to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. And we help each other. When one member suffers, the whole body suffers. 
when one rejoices, we all rejoice. God, I, I pray for unhypocritical love. Let it be pure. Let us care. Let us help one another to our true home. And God, let us celebrate continually that we are no longer under the wrath of God and let us be the best worshipers on the face of the earth because of this gospel. God, I pray for any unbelievers who have come in that they would see what this gospel does to hearts when you realize Christ died on a cross so that your sins could be forgiven completely. God, may they, may they cry out now by the love that they're watching and seeing. I want to know this God. I want to be saved from my selfishness and my sin. God grant salvation to any who need it this morning in this place. God, I thank you for this beautiful season and time that we've had in Romans. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.